to when progressive decoupling makes sense. Um, we are excited to be here and are looking forward to sharing some case studies about decoupling Drupal. I am Kay Thayer. I work with Atom Design Group as a full stack developer. Uh, and my name is Peter Weber. I'm a front end developer at Atom Design Group. Atom Design Group is a digital services design and development agency based out of Denver, Colorado. Um, we work with amazing organizations like Stanford University, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, and Richland Library, to name a few. We love working with cause-driven organizations on work that matters. All right, so through progressive decoupling, what is progressive about decoupling? So with uh, a fully decoupled website, you are using Drupal as your API and are using something like a JavaScript framework, most likely, to wholly replace all the admin and front end um, components. And in progressive decoupling, you're going to mostly be using Drupal for your front end rendering and then dropping in uh, a JavaScript application here or there on a feature or two. Good question. Why not just keep Drupal? Uh, there's a lot of great things about Drupal out of the box and it's gotten better with Drupal 8. <coughs> so if you already have a website going and it's on Drupal, uh, there's a lot of great things inside of Drupal now in core. Uh, it has the Twig templating engine, easy to work with. A lot of great APIs like the form API. Uh, there's built-in roles and permissions, uh, routing, and uh, obviously with Drupal 8 now, a proper package manager. Uh, if you already have a, an existing team working on your website, uh, just to state the obvious, if you are adding a framework other than Drupal PHP to your website, you will need to maintain that framework for the duration, the lifetime of your website. So uh, onboarding becomes uh, more of a, a concern. Um, Obviously, you will need to double the amount of resources for any new framework that you would be adding. So, why would you decouple? Um, if, if you need um, a, an experience that's more like a single page app, then obviously the, the routing API is not gonna matter too much for you. Uh, if you just need something that looks more um, reactive, looks more beautiful or you have a, you just want to turn on GraphQL module and write a couple of line of JavaScripts and wholly replace something that would have taken a long time in Drupal to replicate, uh, that would be a really good reason to decouple. Um, if you need to create a, a branded interface for third party APIs, <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you're working with something other than the Drupal API, maybe the JavaScript framework would be a little more inside of your comfort zone. All right, so if you have a, a website already in Drupal and you just want to maybe play around uh, with a JavaScript framework, you can do an incremental decoupling. Um, and we're going to look at some case studies where we are using a few different techniques to get a, a JavaScript application just on your website. Um, this is a quote from David Hanemeyer Hansen. Uh, he's outside the Drupal community, obviously. He's the inventor of Ruby on Rails. But I was listening to a podcast um, where he was discussing a JavaScript framework that they developed for, um, for Basecamp, which is their big product. Um, and the thing I liked about it was that he talked about using Ruby, um, or in our case using PHP, to actually do all the server-side rendering. That's a big issue with decoupled projects in general, is making sure that you're doing server-side rendering for a variety of reasons. Um, but his theory was that the JavaScript parts were adding interactivity to the page, and the page should already be delivered 
by your CMS or by your server-side application. Um, so I thought this quote was really interesting because he talks about just sort of treating these ideas, these, these elements as a progressive enhancement. So the idea of progressive decoupling is layering on top of your existing system rather than fully replacing part of it. Um, so that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about. Um, I wanted to show this example from a site that we built. I'll, I'll click over um, between the slide and, and the site just to show you, but I wanted to illustrate this point just to start with that we had um, a library website that had different audiences, and so the menu, uh, everything about the site was built in Drupal. There was no, um, no plan to ever fully decouple the site, but there was an element where um, the menu was slightly complicated because when you're in different sections, your submenu, that darker blue bar at the bottom, actually pointed to a different page, and so your all ages uh, research tools, your elementary school research tools, and your middle school research tools all went to completely different pages. And for the mobile UI, uh, our designer wanted to have a way. <clears throat> excuse me. Our designer wanted to have a way to make this um, keep you in your in your audience, so to speak. So if you're in uh, middle school, when you click that menu button, you should see those middle school options only. And so she wanted you to be able to click back um, into the all ages. And let me just let me just demo this real briefly. So here on this menu, she wanted to have this interaction where you can you can change your grade and then go back to um, that sort of all ages menu. And so we're able to build just the mobile menu using View. And to do that, um, what we had to do was get that data from Drupal. So we already had this menu built, so we're able to parse over those links per page um, and get a nice object that gives us the information we need to build JavaScript front end. So this is just a sample of some code. Um, this, this function just kind of grabs the menu. Um, it takes the parts we care about, which is just the URL, the title, and then whether or not it's an active page. Since this is a Drupal 7 site, uh, we're able to build these links, um, or we're able to build out some objects and then put them right into JavaScript with Dr Drupal Add.js. So this is just using Drupal settings. And what we get is an object that's um, hard to see on that screen, but it's it's just two simple objects of the menu and the submenu, but again, just the properties that we care about for our app. And so this is something that loads very easily into the view app we have. You can see there's the URL, the title, and whether or not this page is active. So in Vue, um, if, if anyone's familiar with Vue, um, the templating language is, is very nice to look at compared to JSX, for example. Um, I love React, but Vue tends to be a little bit cleaner and more readable. And this is just an excerpt from the code. Um, this is just a nav element. And you can see that we have things like um, like whether or not it's active menu. And in our objects right there, it says for item and main menu. You can see this object here says main menu is that first object. For item and main menu, do item URL, whether it's active, and then the title. So this is very readable and very simple. And we've just provided the information we need from Drupal um, into our view app, which we can embed on the page. The other big part of this particular menu that made it useful to do dynamically is that we had a search bar. And so, um, let me just click back briefly to the site again. If you're on um, a page, you have this drop down here, but for the mobile view, we wanted to tuck that into the menu. And this library selection changes depending, again, on your audience. Like if you're middle school, elementary school, we wanted to show local schools for Nashville in this case. Um, and so all that content was controlled in Drupal, but we wanted to expose that to view um, and create a dynamic interface. So here's just a, a screenshot of the Drupal side. We're able to just create a simple entity uh, that just contains the school name, um, its IP address, which we we're using to try to detect if you're actually a student at that school. Um, we just jump you straight to your audience. If you're a middle school, you go to the middle school section. And so we kept track of whether or not they're middle school, elementary school, and then each school has an ID, which is used in their search bar. So once you've selected that school, um, in that drop down again, sorry to keep jumping back and forth, once you've picked a school, the action on that form changes to let you go to you know, 850.nashville.library. So again, this is something that was very simple to do in Drupal. It's an interface that the client is familiar with. They can go in and edit it. And then we do the same trick with Drupal settings. We can expose just the things we care about, um, grab the school name uh, and their school ID. Um, and we can skip the IP address because this Drupal settings, don't forget, is a, is a public object. So we don't necessarily want to expose all that information. But we get the, the things we need, and we can build a separate list for middle school or for all ages. Okay. 
So next we have the Stanford Summer Session <coughs> website. This is a very beautiful website. Just take it in for a second. Um, there, uh, we're using a view application just on a few pages. Uh, one of them is starting the application process. So there's actually two different apps going on here. One of them is handling the paging and uh, what content gets loaded in there. And then another, um, not on this particular screenshot, but we have a tuition calculator app that is actually calculating the uh, what your tuition would be for the summer. Um, spoiler alert, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. Sorry. <laughs> right, so this is leveraging um, a lot of Drupal's core functionality. So content editors will log into the website and they create a node that is uh, using paragraphs as, uh, on that content type uh, to enter all the tuition fees per student level. Then when you go to that page, uh, it is using a Drupal, uh, yeah, it is, it's actually using the, the routing API to grab the content of that node and then uh, serialize it into an array and pass it into the browser using Drupal settings. Um, and then we're using mutations every time you uh, page through each step. And um, when you set the options, you know, this is my student level, this is uh, my situation, international, you know, et cetera. And then uh, actually doing the calculation. So you can see here there's a, it's, it's just basically, uh, you, you enter in the information for each student level and put in what the fees for each different aspect of uh, that summer session would be. Okay, so on the Drupal end, what you're seeing here over on the right is, oh, it's a little hard to read, isn't it? Um, all right, so over on the right, this is what you would put into your module dot, uh, the, the libraries. YAML file, so it would be the calculator and then putting in the uh, JS, the, the actual build ver built version of your app, um, and the name of the module is pager. So uh, over on the left, this is uh, the block that's being loaded onto that page, and you can see that it is uh, bringing in the the route match interface to get the node that we're currently on, and then using the serializer API to turn it into an array, then we are attaching, using Drupal settings, that calculator data, and then putting the uh, calculator JavaScript onto the page. And then finally, you can see in the markup section, putting in that, that div, which, uh, which would then, you know, the, the JavaScript you know, famously replaces with your nice little app. You want to talk about Vue? Sure. Um, so again, this is just a snippet of code. Uh, this is on the, Vue, the JavaScript side. <clears throat> you saw that the ID that Kay just mentioned where it's div ID calculator, that's just the container. And this is described here in this view code. You're, so you're, you're sort of creating your app and you're telling it the L is calculator and that's where the view app goes into. Um, so again, we just created a block and added it to the page. Um, again, here's another little just snippet of the view code. Uh, this calculator, we, each one is a screen. Um, and let me pop back real quick just to show you a quick demo of how this works. Um, this is the application process one. After you've picked your level, you have a different path. So your application process will be different depending on whether you're a high school student or an undergraduate. Um, once you've answered that first question, you get this set of steps like one through 11, uh, it may be one through 15 if you're a high school student. Um, as you click through, um, you can just read these steps. That's why we call it a pager, because you're just really kind of clicking through the site. Um, the one thing about this is that it has a menu as well, so you can jump through here um, and, and click quickly to another step. The way the tuition calculator works is a little bit different because you'll have a screen, you get started, you still pick a level, but then you start choosing options. Like, 
do I need this program? Will I be living on campus? How many units do I plan to take? And once you've gotten to the end of this, you'll get a, a sort of a, sum, a summary page with all your results. So the idea here is that we have a set of screens, and we click through them. All that data comes from Drupal because it's the way the structure in Drupal is, is just using the paragraphs module. So we start with a paragraph that counts as like a, a screen, and then within that screen there's um, different steps. Um, same thing with fees, we'll start with a level, like undergraduate, and then within that there's a fee structure that is nested within. So for the admin, the idea is to have everything kind of nested under its group, and then we really pretty much just return that object back to um, view and, and treat them as separate screens and then finally the results page which you can see at the bottom here. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about briefly with decoupling is this idea that if you're getting your data from Drupal or from any sort of API, uh, it isn't always a good idea to just use production data or you may be using development data while you're testing. Um, if you want to do something like hot reloading, it may be more simple just to have a JavaScript app running that's not even connected to Drupal. So this is a sample, um, if, if you're familiar with Webpack, you can add a plugin, um, this is Webpack 3, so you can add a plugin um, where it's just doing a simple string replacement. It's looking for this string that's app target in all caps. Um, and then what that does is it'll replace it with, uh, with your note with your environment. So in this case, I want to say, like, am I on dev or am I on prod? And depending on whether I'm on dev or prod, I'm going to load a fully different file. So in my other file where I'm importing this data file, um, that app target will get substituted with the environment. So I'll actually have a file called calcdatadev.js, and that will get loaded when I'm running my dev environment, and it'll run the prod file when I'm running my prod environment. And so you can see the difference between these two files. In my settings dev, I actually have this big snippet of uh, JavaScript with all the objects I need, all the things that you saw um, briefly in that code editor in the admin side of Drupal, where we can put in like a body field. In this case, this is the body value. Um, then there's all those fee groups, which are all paragraphs. So this is all my test data, and I can actually hard, hard code this into my app while I'm working. Um, but then when I produce my production JavaScript, I don't want any of that test data to be there. So I can just say that I'm getting it from Drupal settings. So then when, that act when the app is actually loading in a Drupal site, that Drupal settings object is available, and you're getting the fresh data. Um, but you don't need it. You don't need to be dependent on it. Um, so this is just a, a quick, um, I don't know if it's a pro tip, but um, when you're in your Chrome console and your developer tools, you can actually type a variable name to print it out to the screen. But Chrome gives you this very nice browser where you can kind of uncollapse the arrows and, and explore an object, but that's not very good for copying and pasting. So you can JSON stringify that same data, um, but then why stop there when you can actually copy that JSON stringified text straight to your clipboard and then you can just paste it right in. So if you wanted to get some fresh data really quickly, you can just run this command, get your Drupal settings object, paste it into your JavaScript and save it, and you have fresh uh, test data. Um, and I just wanted to show another couple things while we're here. Um, we talk about decoupling because um, when you're doing progressive decoupling, one thing that Drupal does very well is, is generates a page. And so this is the page with JavaScript disabled. And so I just have some default text. Like this app isn't running, but because the body field is still there, we can show the body field. And so we don't need to do anything fancy to have kind of a server-side rendered page. And this isn't necessarily what we want, but it at least is something for the user. Um, whereas if JavaScript is enabled, then you have the actual app. And you can go in and make changes to things, and it'll it'll um, update the totals uh, live for you. So when I talked about doing that dev version of the site. So this is um, just running on localhost. You can see um, this is just uh, run. It's using the Webpack uh, developer server. So it's a super nice tool that just spins up um, sort of a, a fake localhost for you, just on the fly. Um, so this is running the development version of everything. So I'm using my developer data, but I'm also using developer view. And so that gives you this um, really impossible to see on the screen view, but you can see, again, we talked about screens. So view lets you explore this. You can see here's all my different screens, my screen start, um, and then the following screens for each of these steps. This site's using view X, and so you can see, um, let me zoom in a little bit. Um, this is the object that I'm pulling from Drupal settings, but then cleaning up a little bit to get my fees. Um, so all this lives in here. These, you can recognize field names, and then all these are, are parsed into just the things that we care about for view. So the amount, the text, um, and then the fee itself. 
And as I click through this, um, I want to show that this um, current slide is negative one because we haven't really begun the application. The fees themselves, like there's no total, no sub there's no total amount yet. Um, even the fees object is undefined. But once you get started and pick a level, you can see immediately that fees object populates. And so if UX um, gives you this really nice inspector that lets you see that I called the next section, I set an answer, um, and you can really step through your application very nicely with this view inspector tool. Um, and again, this is something that works very well when you're using uh, the development versions of all your code. The Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver has an amazing project called the Octopus Initiative. You go to their website and you see a bunch of artwork from local artists that you can click on these little hearts, as you can see on the screen. It will prompt you for your email address and your zip code, because you have to live in Denver. And every month there is a lottery where they pick a bunch of winners and if you're chosen you get to rent out essentially that artwork for free for a year. That's just a little intro for the project. What that actually looks like on the development end is we're creating entries, we're creating lotteries, there are notifications that have to go out and we're using Mandrel for those, um, for transactional emails. Um, now, this is a project where we're actually not using, oh, sometimes when you say front end, what you think is what the visitors see. Um, we're using a front end React app on what would be considered the back end, the admin view. So this part right here is just straight Drupal, but on the admin dashboard, there is a React app going on that is showing all of the entries and then allowing them to, um, and the, and the administrators that is, to pick the winners. So here would be the art that you can um, select. The, these are all the artworks that are available for this month's lottery and they would just go in and click on pick winners and it would automatically just randomly pick a bunch of winners and then um, when you hit save it goes and makes all of the tickets for you know keeping tabs on where the artwork is and uh, sends out all of the you won or you lost emails. So again here you can see uh, the entries and it shows the winners. Uh, did you want to say more about this? Sure. Um, yeah, I wanted to to go back and just talk a little bit about the the what we, the point that we made at the very beginning was that if you do already have a website or you already have a team, uh, it makes sense to to keep going with that in a lot of cases. And so for the MCA, we had just built a new website for their for their museum overall. And so they had a design, they had um, a theme that we'd already built. They were all used to using Drupal eight. And so when they asked for this new project, um, it made sense to leverage some of those assets that we already built for them. So they both saved money, and they also um, were, got a new platform that looked a lot like the platform that we had just built and just delivered. So the other thing is that, um, as Kay mentioned, the, these hearts, this is just using the flag module. So we're able to leverage Drupal Contrib to have something that, that, is, that works very well out of the box um, and lets you, create, lets, lets you allow users to individually like and unlike um, different pieces of artwork. And so the backend experience is really where it got a little bit more complicated because we wanted to build something that acted like a, a raffle almost, where if you had a big fishbowl full of tickets, you could reach in, pick one out, and pick a winner. And so there's some complexity with that. Um, in this screenshot, you can see that we already have some winners. Um, so in a given lottery, we'd um, raffle off you know, usually around 15 pieces of art. And so we wanted to make sure that someone didn't win twice. We wanted to make sure that someone who had already won last month didn't win again. Um, there's a lot of factors in there and logic needed to happen. And so we're able to load all those things um, with GraphQL. Um, so this is just a quick demo. If you have not seen uh, the GraphQL module on Drupal, this is using Grapha, GraphQL, I don't know how you say it. Um, but this is something that uh, they didn't build, but they, they added into the module. So this is in Drupal. You can actually explore all of your entities. If you create a custom entity, its schema gets exposed as well. So it's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, I just want to give a, a quick example here. Like if I um, 
click play on this, I'll get a count of all my nodes. And I've, um, sorry, I apologize for the size. Um, this is a very simple filter. I've just done a node query. I'm querying, I'm adding some conditions, which is I only want artwork type, and I only want things that are published. And all I'm getting here is a count, but I could easily get um, entities. And so if I'm getting an entity, there's things about that entity that are specific to it, like fields that it has. Um, and so what you want to do is create something called a fragment. So I don't just want all entity properties. I want specific um, artwork properties. So I can the shorthand for that is just this dot, 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 and then an artwork fragment, which I'm going to um, add in here. For this demo, I'm just going to show you that artworks have an artist field. So every piece of art has a, an entity reference to the artist node. Um, and so you can also do a fragment there. And so just in a few lines of code, you can drill down through two entity references, and you get something like this, where in this object, now I have an object that is something that I would want to have in JavaScript, which is just the things I care about, the title of the art, and then the title, the name of the artist that painted it. Uh, so with this um, thing we were building, we wanted to do a pretty complicated reference. So we start out with an artwork, then you drill down to entries for their artwork, which is actually a reverse entity reference, which is something that the GraphQL module provides. So I can ask for entities that reference this artwork, and then I'm not done, I want to find out who is the user that created that entry, and then I want to find out more about that user, like do they have open tickets? Um, so like you can see this guy here, I've blurred him out, but this is an open ticket, so this is a previous winner. I don't want them to even be enabled, so they're actually disabled from this, um, from this dropdown. So when I click pick winners, there's no way for that person to get chosen. And so this kind of interactivity um, is really possible with GraphQL to do these very complex queries, very nested queries, and get back an object that looks exactly like what you asked for. You know, just by writing it like this, I get back um, something that's the same shape. Um, this is an incomplete snippet, but this is a mutation. So once you've picked your winner, you want to be able to set that winner. And so this mutation is um, something that uh, the GraphQL module provides. Um, you have to write your own PHP. Let me see if I can get it. First, you have to declare an, uh, an entry input. Um, this is using an annotation, and so you want to make sure that you get the annotation right. Um, one of the things I had trouble with when I first started learning Drupal 8 was that comments matter, and I screwed that up a lot. Um, and so this one here, I actually had a small typo. I had like the graph and GraphQL lowercase. And it didn't work, and it works on your Mac because Macs are less strict about case than when you put it on production and you're using a Linux server and it doesn't like it. And those are fun bugs to track down uh, at 2 in the morning. So once you get this annotation right and you write this very simple um, plugin, then this one's a little bit harder to see, but um, again, you have a mutation, um, and all you're doing is passing in some arguments. So in this case, all I care about is setting a winner field. I want that winner field to be set to true, and that's all. And so with that snippet of um, JavaScript, you can just pass that simple operation back to um, the GraphQL module, which is using your custom plugin that you wrote. Um, and you can do a lot of transformations that way. Sorry, I'm bad with clicking on tabs. Um, but again, the interface for the client is super simple because all they have to do is click this Pick Winners button click save, and then they get a list of winners um, that they can confirm. Right, so just to recap, um, so we haven't really talked about the actual module. It is as simple as getting this GraphQL module and just turning it on. It is basically a JavaScript implementation of, it's it's an alternate version of REST API. So yes, you can do all of this using Drupal's built-in API. Um, the benefit of GraphQL is that you can just use JavaScript and say, this is exactly what I want. Uh, don't return anything else. Whereas with the REST API, you'd have to kind of get a fire hose and then figure out what, which ones you actually need. All right, so with uh, Drupal, it is fairly simple. We ha are using the routing API over here on the left. We are declaring the 
this admin dashboard is going to use dash controller render. Um, and then over on the right, you can see that we are implementing that dash controller and not even returning markup, we're just attaching that library. And on the bottom, you can see that the library is this compiled version of the React app. And then over here is the actual, this is not the built version, this is the source of the React and GraphQL queries. So we're bringing in the GraphQL library also on the uh, node end uh, and actually passing in that um, that query asking, and this is just a small cut version of it, uh, asking for a, a thumbnail and only getting the alt text, the title, and getting that thumbnail uh, URL with the height and the width. Um, yeah, and just to mention, this is again, it's a fragment, so like I, I talked before, you just have that dot to dot syntax, and then this describes the object you want to get back. Um, so GraphQL module is really nice because it uses Drupal image styles, so that thumbnail is just an image style, so we're actually getting the 100 by 100 image um, in, our, in our app. Um, we're, so on this front end, we're also using um, Apollo to do all our queries because it handles GraphQL really nicely. Um, Apollo treats a GraphQL, it sort of has its own built-in Redux store, so once it loads that, uh, the result of that query, uh, it, you can have it available right away. <clears throat> um, and then this is just another, uh, another couple snippets from JavaScript. And you can see, uh, if you look at that node query, that's exactly what I typed into that GraphQL Explorer. So you can play around with that and get your queries the way you want to before you ever write any JavaScript. And then once you do start writing your JavaScript, all you need is that GQL library, um, which you can see up here at the top, it's doing GQL backtick after that const query. And that's processing that, uh, that bit of string and turning it into a GraphQL query. Um, so, and so just to kind of recap a bit as well, like the first we're talking about using Drupal settings. Um, using GraphQL gives you um, a lot of this processing out of the box. So with Drupal settings, I was writing my own code to, you know, get the data I wanted, and I maybe have to process that a bit. Maybe you have to worry about things like um, access and permissions. Uh, with GraphQL, a lot of those are a lot of that work is done for you. So as Kay mentioned, you don't you get that firehose from Drupal. You get things that you maybe don't care about, like the created timestamp or um, a lot a lot of cruft around fields that you just don't need, and in GraphQL you can just pick out the things you want and send that to your front end. So as a front end developer, it's a, it's a much nicer, cleaner experience. Now, we did some work on Richland Library in South Carolina, and we did um, a lot of things. Since they're a library, they, they have a, a library catalog that's a completely separate application. Everything that we're doing on it, though, is done in PHP and Drupal. So um, one of our back end developers wrote a new API to connect to the Polaris catalog, uh, and all that's in PHP. And so many places on the site, we need to use um, Drupal to connect to Polaris. Like for example, when you log in with your library card number, we actually need to contact the Polaris API to, to get that uh, external authentication. So all this work was done in Drupal. We're building a Drupal site. But we want to have things that are more dynamic. So in this case, we're able to make a block using, um, the, and this is not a, a decoupled element, just as an example. So this block is, is done. It's rendered in PHP using templates, using Twig. Um, we're pinging Polaris and we're getting back the data we care about, um, but then we have a block which we can embed on the user's page. However, um, we can also build other account pages too, and so we can build all these routes in Drupal. Um, we can create API routes which hit our custom controllers, which then in turn uh, hit the Polaris API. So we're using Drupal almost like a middleware. We're using Drupal to process um, API requests and then process the responses. That we return objects that are more useful on the front end. Um, so again, these are just the snippets from, this would be um, the routing.yaml file, and this is just a few of the ones you have. You can control access here. These are all set to true, but normally you'd set access to, um, to your own method that checks to make sure that the user is authenticated. Um, so you have a lot more control over this. Um, and so because all these are, are API calls, we can use a tool like Postman. Um, and I wanted to show, I have Postman up. Um, if you haven't used Postman before, um, it's a really, really nice tool for, um, for doing API calls. This is uh, doing actually a library search, and so we're doing a search grouping, um, which I'll come back to in a bit, but we get back um, these objects that I've, you can process this all in, in 
and Drupal and then return it um, from this endpoint. And so your endpoint is up here, um, and you can add in you know, your X debugs. You can actually stop and see what's going on. Um, I dropped out all the account slides. Search results. Um, so that was a search result. So we um, we built a, a search app for the library. Uh, this is a, a comp, and I'll show the demo in just a second because it's still a work in progress. Um, but the idea is that we're searching their library catalog, but then we're doing more processing on those results um, in Drupal, and then again on the front end, building an app that you can use to control the queries you're sending. So for example, I want a different sorting. I want to you know filter down by different subjects, um, and then. Um, so all this is built in the front end as a React app that lives on, on the site. But we build um, a lot of these gets all over the, the website because there's Drupal pages where we wanted to just load a single, um, a single item from their bibliography. Um, and we can use that same code to, to create objects that we pass on to the front end. Uh, so this is running on my local dev, but it's connected to, um, to Polaris itself. So when you make a search, um, a lot of processing is happening on the back end. But what's nice about the front end is that we can hit all these different calls separately. So this result is from one endpoint, but then these filter, this filter count comes from a separate endpoint. And so again, if you go back to Postman, you can see that this is my result. Um, I don't think you can zoom on Postman. But then I have a filter result, which is just giving me a count. So you can see that I have value and then the title and then the actual count of how many of each of those subjects there are. And so when you do, um, when you do actions in this, in this app, um, because it's in the front end we can control when we hit those APIs. Um, so when I do a different sort, I know that my results are going to change, but my count is not going to change. And so because the count is a more expensive query, I don't want to just call it again, because what we're doing to get the count is actually doing a very large query and then reducing over that and, and adding them up. Um, and so we don't want to do that every time. So when I switch my sorting, um, you can see that that filter section um, on the right sidebar didn't change at all. But then, um, hopefully this results page will load back up again. Um, one thing I want to talk about as well with this is that because we're doing everything in Drupal, we can take advantage of a lot of server-side stuff. So um, one of the things that we want to do with this project was do some caching. Um, and this is a bad demo because it's really slow right now. Um, <laughs> But I, I blame it on the on the internet here. Um, we are able to use uh, server side tools for caching. So in this case, we're doing a pretty expensive lookup to do um, what we're doing is grouping. Um, I'm going to change off of that. I embarrass myself. Um, to do a grouping, we wanted to actually search the catalog for an item, and then we wanted to search for items like it. So if we found a, a book title, we'd want to search for that same title and author and get things like ebooks, e audiobooks. Um, and return all those and then group them. And so you can imagine that's a fairly expensive operation because it's several calls um, to the same API. Uh, and you don't want to have to do that every time for every single item when you have 10, 20, 50 items on the page. So we're able to, um, at first we struggled with how to do this because we wanted to host on, on Pantheon. And Pantheon is one of our go-tos, but um, it has sort of a set idea of how a, a Drupal site should work. Um, you don't necessarily have a lot of choices with adding like a MongoDB or something like that. Um, but we realized that what Pantheon does have out of the box is Redis. And so we're able to take one of these expensive calls and then just stringify it, um, or serialize it, excuse me, and save that in Redis. And so the next time we get that same result, we're able to just grab that key, pull it out of Redis, and load that directly instead. And so, um, so it speeds up the, the results much uh, like a, by you know, a factor of 100 or, or more. It's, um, Redis is ridiculously fast. Uh, and so from the front-end experience, there's no difference at all because you're just getting your results more quickly. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, if, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, why did you use Drupal settings at all for the first example? Oh, um, well, so it was a Drupal 7 site, um, and we thought that Drupal settings was a good way to, to handle it because we're just loading a very simple object that we just need um, publicly. And 
Um, it was easy to make that in the back end, so we were able to just grab the few things we needed and, and then just expose it right away to JavaScript as a global object. Um, so it just seemed like a very simple and an easy way to handle it. There was no need to do anything super fancy with like a custom route or, or anything at all. It also, um, Drupal settings can be cached uh, per page. And so that's, that was ideal for our use case because we wanted to know, is the current page I'm on the active page? Um, so the, the question was, why, why did we use Drupal settings at all? All right, well, um, I hope that was uh, sort of a, a, a good um, overview of some ideas that might inspire you when you're building your own applications. Um, we really, uh, we've, we've worked a lot in Drupal and we uh, love using front end tools, but it's nice to keep some of the things that you're familiar with. And so um, I hope this gives you some ideas for how to leverage your Drupal sites, but then add some new layers of dynamic elements on top of them.